Okay, well, we'll uh, um, start, even though the, the, some people will inevitably be uh, uh, late, including the president of the university, who's at a seminar on uh, risk management. And one of the major risks uh, in NU is everything starts uh, a little bit late. Uh, but one of the advantages of um, being a university in the uh, capital city is that when really important people roll into town, we can have an opportunity to, uh, uh, to capture them for a little, uh, a little while. And today is one of those uh, uh, occasions. The, uh, uh, the government yesterday put on a very interesting uh, conference uh, as part of uh, preparations for Kazakhstan's accession to the uh, World Trade Organization. And uh, uh, we, got the, uh, we got the pick of the three best speakers. Uh, and here they are. Um, it could have been Tony Blair, but he just didn't make the cut. Um, Ramona Prodi. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so anyway, this is to, to, to our advantage. And, and the, we, the, our speakers today are, uh, are Rufus uh, Yupcha, <laughs> we're going to do, a U.S. Uh, diplomat and, and veteran trade uh, negotiator, who's going to begin by giving us an over uh, view. Uh, Ambassador Alatobi, who's the um, uh, we'll have a PowerPoint presentation is then going to talk a little bit about the, uh, the technicalities of the, uh, of the negotiations and where, uh, and where they're uh, at. And Shindu uh, Asakwe is going to give a sort of political view because from his, from his uh, standpoint as uh, director of the World Trade Organization's Accession Division, he's been very, very much uh, involved with the uh, Kazakhstan uh, application. Indeed, as has the ambassador, uh, who is the ambassador for Saudi Arabia to the World Trade Organization in, uh, uh, in Geneva, and he will tell us a little bit about what impact being a member of the World Trade Organization has had on his own uh, country and what the prospects are for Kazakhstan. The uh, ambition to join the WTO has been a, a long-standing one for the government of Kazakhstan. Uh, I think it was first mentioned in 1996 when Kazakhstan got observer status at uh, the WTO. Uh, if we do get um, negotiations through and there is uh, uh, membership, of course, coming, which we hope to be this year, I don't know whether you'll tell us whether <laughs> that will happen, uh, will be major adjustments for, for Kazakhstan and some sectors more than others, particularly around agriculture, for instance. There will be major benefits to Kazakhstan. Uh, a further integration of the country into the world uh, economy, an expansion of trade, we would hope, very different conditions for inward financial uh, foreign direct uh, investment. But all of this I'm going to talk about today in the context of the uh, Eurasian Economic Union. Uh, and uh, I suppose in the background, there may be, some of us may have the remarks made uh, by the uh, leader of a neighboring country about what it is to be a state and how you qualify for such a status. But anyway, uh, I, don't know, I don't know whether any of you want to tread onto that ground. Uh, but at the end, then, um, there'll be 30 seconds for questions. Uh, oh, 30 minutes? I thought you said 30 seconds. Yeah. And we planted one over here, just so we were somebody to start off. Uh, okay, so will you uh, kick off? Can I? Can you hear me? Well, first of all, on behalf of myself and my two colleagues, uh, we want to thank you for inviting us to speak to you today. Um, for all three of us, it's our first visit to Kazakhstan, and uh, we're finding it not only uh, fascinating but very rewarding for us. And of course, um, as our host mentioned, uh, we all three have had a lot of involvement with the WTO. I left uh, the organization, I retired as a, a deputy director general uh, last fall, and actually it's a great pleasure for me to be speaking to a group of students because I'm now teaching at an institute for international studies in, in California, uh, and uh, I teach students about the WTO system. So uh, it's, it's always good to see a group of, of students uh, involved in international studies, taking an interest uh, in the world, you know, you're living in a very uh, dangerous but also exciting era of history. 
um, and certainly for your country uh, to begin to uh, have the opportunity to look outward at the world. Uh, you, as the, the young students being uh, educated in an international age, it's the future is going to be bright for you, I think, uh, but also full of challenges. And the most important thing to have uh, as an asset for you as you approach those challenges is a clear knowledge and understanding of the international system and of its history and its evolution. Uh, we're here at a conference to talk about uh, uh, the process of WTO accession, and my two colleagues are actively involved with that in Geneva. Uh, Katie Osake, who, as, as you mentioned, is the director of the division in the WTO that is handling Kazakhstan's accession. Um, so he's an international civil servant, uh, originally from Nigeria, uh, and worked as a, uh, a diplomat, but uh, is now actually representing, when you ask Kedu who is my boss, he says I have 160 bosses because uh, he works for the Secretariat of International Organization with 160 member countries. And of course, Ambassador al Atabi is the first ambassador, I think, of Saudi Arabia to the WTO. They completed their accession process in 2005, is that correct? So he, he has a very good and solid understanding and a rich knowledge of what the WTO accession process means, and more importantly for Kazakhstan, what the experience will be once you become a member. So we'll, we'll talk about these issues. I want to start briefly by just giving a little bit of sort of historical and global background uh, for this issue that we've been talking about at this, this conference today. The conference was organized by Nazarbayev University um, in, in cooperation, obviously, with, with the government and other institutions, brought together a, a tremendous uh, group of, of international experts and, uh, and players in the world scene. As you mentioned, uh, uh, former Prime Minister Tony Blair was there, Roman Prodi, the former president of the European uh, Commission and also uh, former Prime Minister of Italy, uh, former president of Poland, uh, a number of really uh, outstanding uh, thinkers and leaders. So we had a very good discussion uh, y yesterday, and it's good for us to be able to continue with it today. I'll just make a couple of points, and then I'm going to turn it over to, to my colleagues. I always start with my students uh, uh, of looking at the differences between the experiences uh, of the world community after World War II compared to the uh, kind of experience and the kind of framework that was set up after World War I. And it's very important to understand the history of trade to understand this dichotomy. Um, because after the First World War, um, the, the leaders of the world tried in the Versailles Treaty to set up uh, a nation, a, a, a clearer sort of system of nation states and national sovereignty, but didn't give much emphasis at all to the international architecture. They tried to create a League of Nations, as you, you may know, which President Wilson actually is of the United States was one of the uh, leading uh, uh, proponents of, but of course uh, the United States was becoming a more isolationist country after the First World War and never joined the League of Nations. More importantly, uh, it was a time when global cooperation really deteriorated. You saw the growth of extremism, uh, both fascism and communism, taking over as leading uh, sort of movements uh, you saw the nations of the world not cooperating with one another and eventually building large, uh, very high trade barriers against one another, barriers to both trade and investment. Uh, and uh, I must say my, my own country, the United States, was uh, one of the major ones responsible for that trend, uh, raised its barriers on foreign goods, World trade deteriorated tremendously in the 1930s. The Great Depression uh, deepened. 
Uh, and of course, the end result ultimately was global conflict. Uh, and when World War II ended, uh, there was a very different attitude. Uh, there was a realization that you had to have more enduring international framework for cooperation. You had to build institutions that had credibility. And you had to uh, base these very much on the concept of the free movement of goods and of ideas. Uh, and uh, you built an international both trading framework and an international financial framework. You know, the famous Bretton Woods institutions. So you had the IMF, the World Bank, and at that time, the GATT. Not the WTO, but the GATT. Uh, and by and large, this framework worked very well. Uh, of course, there was a large uh, part of the global community that didn't join these organizations uh, and that stayed essentially uh, in their own systems. And of course, people in Kazakhstan know that history because uh, that was the Soviet Union, it was China, it was a number of other uh, countries in that sphere. And uh, the, the experience of the next 50 years was that the West built a very, very vibrant and viable system of open markets and of global cooperation. Uh, and it's really more that sort of evolution of economic success than anything else that changed the world and that ultimately led to the collapse of the, of the, of the uh, Soviet system. And now what we see is uh, a, a large march of the countries in that uh, former sphere joining into the WTO system, as well as other uh, forms of international cooperation. As you all know, China became a member of the WTO in 2001. Uh, Russia's accession was just completed last year, 2011. Two, little over two years ago, two and a half years ago. Um, by the way, a number of your neighbors, uh, former republics of the Soviet Union also joining, the Kyrgyz Republic, um, Tajikistan, I think Uzbekistan is in the accession process, is that correct? Uh, and of course, the former uh, Baltic states, which eventually became part of the European Union, um, and of course, in um, <coughs> I think Georgia's a member. Armenia? Armenia's a member. Azerbaijan is in the accession process. So clearly, the, the concept of a global framework of rules and of uh, commitment between countries uh, that gives a primacy to the rule of law and to uh, greater uh, cooperation and the peaceful resolution of differences over economic and trade issues uh, is something that has gained enormous credibility. Um, and I think the, the very clear uh, desire of the government here is to be part of that system now, uh, to recognize the opportunity that creates for Kazakhstan uh, to be more integrated into the global economy. Uh, but also the recognition that it has tremendous support, and Peter, I'm sure, will talk about this, from the rest of the world and from the other memberships in the WTO. So we're hopeful that that will be a success, and he'll, he'll talk more about that. And of course, Ambassador Alatabi, because his country has recently acceded, he can give you some very good uh, sort of factual data about what are the benefits. Uh, from the standpoint of a country that has some real similarities to, to Kazakhstan in terms of its natural resources, its, its investment in energy and other things. Um, I will just finish by saying, you know, we can talk a lot about what the consequences are for joining and what the potential benefits are. Very often when people uh, in a society that has been somewhat insulated from the world economy and somewhat protected, and they begin to look at the consequences, there's a natural reaction, particularly from some of the vested interests, that, well, wait a minute, this might be harmful to us. You, you, you heard during Russian expression, for example, certain people arguing, why do we need to be in the WTO? 
we produce a lot of energy products and everything we export to the world, we have no problems exporting. And it just means we're going to have to compete more with imports in our own market. We're going to have to make all kinds of commitments about changing our, our regulations and rules to comply with WTO. And why do we need to do all this? Why can't we just go on doing business as we can? But if you really look at the experience of countries that have joined into the system, going way, way back, and I use the examples in the meeting yesterday of Korea and Mexico uh, as two countries which were initially not part of the system and joined later, Korea in 1967, Mexico not until 1986. And Mexico, when it joined, was a reasonably poor country dominated by its oil industry. Pemex was the largest company in Mexico. A lot of state-owned enterprises, uh, a very, very limited uh, uh, involvement in international trade other than in energy, and also very little foreign investment. And if you look at Mexico today, it's a dramatic difference. Tenth largest economy in the world, uh, a hugely diverse uh, economy, manufacturing sector, that opened up to things like telecommunications because without a state-of-the-art information technology structure, you can't be uh, globally competitive. Uh, and a lot of that was because of Mexico's decision to not just to join the GATT, but also to open up its markets generally and become a more competitive uh, economy. Uh, of course, they negotiated a free trade agreement with the United States and Canada, known as NAFTA. Um, and I, w I was very involved in that negotiation. And, you know, there was a lot of opposition in the United States to it. But what Americans didn't realize is there was just as strong opposition from many quarters within Mexico. Because the people who were rich in Mexico said, why do we need to change this? We're already doing well. But the vast majority of the country still had aspirations to have a much more dynamic, diverse, global, uh, globally uh, involved uh, position in the world. And that is exactly what has happened as a result of their experience. It won't happen overnight. It takes time. But the clear lesson of the post-war, post-World War II era is that the countries that have become more involved and uh, greater parts of the international system have been the most successful. And those that have remained isolated and alone have been the real failures. Uh, I'll just give the example of North Korea as probably the best one. And I think probably for you, many of you, uh, you're fortunate because not only does your government see this, the president uh, clearly has a vision for uh, Kazakhstan. In fact, we've gotten a copy of uh, Kazakhstan 2050, which is clearly a vision that, that has you in a more sensitive role. Chedu yesterday gave a, I'm not going to steal his thunder now because I hope he'll take some of it, but he gave a great explanation of why Kazakhstan, from a strategic point of view, is so perfectly placed to benefit off, uh, it, off its integration into the global economy. So that's my last point to you. You know, the old, the old economic order that Kazakhstan was part of for uh, most of its post-war, post-World War II history, is now no longer valid. It's gone. Uh, it didn't work. The, the Soviet Union didn't work. And now you're facing a new reality. And the most important organizing principle for the global economy now is integration into global markets and into global investment. That's an imperative not just for Kazakhstan, but for everyone. It's true for my country, the United States. You know, a lot of Americans were used to being the most powerful country in the world with the world's biggest economy. At the end of World War II, we were almost one half of the world economy. Uh, the United States was almost 50% of the world economy, and we dominated world markets. But we decided that it was better to spread that prosperity than to keep it at home, and we very active in building this architecture that I'm talking about. Today, the United States is only about 12%, 12 or 13 percent of the world economy. And a lot of Americans look at this and say, we've, we've, uh, we've given up all of our wealth to the rest of the world. But of course, the truth of the matter is we've built so much wealth globally that we're better off, not only as, as 
the world better off, that we're better off. And that's really the lesson, I think, of people who study seriously about international trade. You find that, as one historian once said, either goods and services cross borders or armies cross borders, one or the other, and you have to make your choice. Uh, and that is why, ultimately, it's so important for you to succeed with this process of joining WTO and of becoming a bigger part of the, the international community. Now, I think, are we going to go first to Ambassador Arakabi, who can talk about Saudi Arabia's experience? Thank you. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I am delighted to be here in this beautiful uh, uh, place, beautiful university, and uh, to talk to you. Uh, as uh, uh, the first speaker uh, spoke, um, uh, the presentation that uh, we are going to see, uh, it was prepared for the conference that was held yesterday about uh, Kazakhstan uh, uh, role in the uh, globalizing uh, world. Um, I spoke about the experience of uh, Saudi Arabia as a recently acceded member to the WTO. Saudi Arabia um, uh, joined the WTO in 2005 after 12 years of uh, negotiation. Uh, we learned a great deal about the benefits and the challenges of WTO through the process because uh, the, the process of acceding is, is very challenging for, for each country. And I think it is the first uh, time I, for any country in, in the accession process uh, to have all agencies, all public agency and the private sector to get together and to analyze uh, the national economy and the trade policies of the country in order to, to, to see how to benefit from the accession, from uh, joining the WTO, and how also uh, to, uh, uh, to comply with the uh, WTO rules. Uh, after joining uh, WTO, the Kingdom's economic progress since 2005, shows a positive correlation between WTO membership and economic growth. Uh, uh, we strongly support uh, Kazakhstan bid to join the WTO in fair terms and the completion of uh, the negotiation as soon as possible. As for the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia's progress since WTO accession, major indicators have improved rather markedly since our uh, WTO accession due to the efforts of the Kingdom and the positive association between WTO rules and economic growth. And the following slides show indicators of our progress. And these slides or uh, uh, indicators are from international organization. For example, the first slide, um, the World Bank indicators of Saudi Arabia's economic performance. We see the GDP gross domestic product, and we see export of goods and services, and we see also uh, uh, gross national income per capita. Uh, uh, purchasing power parity. Uh, both are increasing, and you see in the, in the blue line the, uh, at 2005, which is the date of, uh, or the time of uh, the accession of Saudi Arabia. In the second um, uh, slide, it shows the World Economic Forum indicators after the both after uh, Saudi Arabia acceded to, to WTO, how is the ranking? Uh, we see that uh, the ranking of Saudi Arabia uh, strongly um, uh, improved 
with regard to global competitiveness index, with regard to intellectual property protection, and with, with regard to good market efficiency. And the other slide, it shows the investment, the foreign direct investment in Saudi Arabia. You see it was uh, until uh, the time of accession, then it went uh, up uh, uh, very, very uh, dramatic from 2006 to uh, the last uh, information uh, available 2013. And finally, the non oil exports also it sh shows the increase. Um, uh, you will notice that uh, uh, in 2008, starting from 2008 and 2009, this is the um, uh, world financial crisis. But after that, it, uh, it continued to, to, to rise, the non oil exports. Uh, the final um, slide here, it is about uh, the uh, importance of WTO rules for key Saudi Arabian uh, exports. Um, uh, the Saudi uh, economy is similar to, uh, to Kazakhstan to a certain extent, in, in a way that it, uh, it relies heavily on, on uh, oil. So the diversification um, in Saudi Arabia uh, led to uh, exporting steel and petrochemic uh, petrochemical products. These sectors, which is the steel and petrochemical products, represent 62% of national, uh, of all national uh, anti-dumping cases, and also 50 57% uh, of all counterfeiting duty cases, which, is, which are usually used to, um, uh, to protect uh, um, uh, other markets. So uh, Saudi Arabia has faced such investigations but avoided restrictions on our trade uh, due to uh, a proactive approach which re relies on WTO-based rules. In other words, without uh, the rules of WTO, as a member of WTO, we, we, uh, it would be um, uh, difficult for Saudi Arabia to avoid these restrictions in other markets. So to summarize uh, the benefits of membership, uh, the above uh, evidence shows that WTO accession has supported positive growth in the Saudi economy for almost 10 years now, notwithstanding the global financial crisis. Usually we are faced, um, or we, we hear the question of, okay, what does uh, uh, the accession or joining WTO, what does it mean for uh, an ordinary person? how uh, uh, a citizen benefit from the membership of his country to WTO. I think the average person on the street benefits from WTO protections uh, uh, through export-related uh, jobs, uh, also through enhancement of con consumer welfare, and from access to high quality affordable products and services in the market, whether insurance or by banking services, local industrial production, or other. Uh, the benefits depend on uh, wise uh, leadership in parallel to WTO rules. In other words, the uh, membership to WTO by itself cannot guarantee the improvement or the welfare of the country, but it's it's the wise leadership of the country and the, the, the economy of itself. You, you, uh, the, the accession to WTO or the membership to WTO, as it, you are linked to the highway. So it depends on your vehicle. If your vehicle, if your economy is, is healthy and strong, then you can benefit.
challenges in the accession process, um, uh, request for WTO plus commitment. Um, during, uh, I mean, uh, the accession process always is a challenging uh, and very difficult because uh, unless you have a strong uh, negotiating team with a strong leadership, then you will, you will have a tremendous um, request from other countries in order to, to uh, allow uh, the acceding uh, country to be uh, accepted to WTO. Um, Saudi Arabia's response was to focus on WTO discipline and the actual commercial interest of trading partners. Also acquiring the necessary uh, WTO uh, trade expertise, Saudi Arabia uh, responses create public-private partnership and utilize training from the WTO and others. And uh, uh, from uh, my knowledge and um, interact with, with the, the Kazakhstan team, I think Kazakhstan already has a strong leadership and a deeply knowledgeable and competent negotiating team. Uh, the last uh, slides here, and then I will uh, end my uh, presentation. Issues for new membership, uh, for new members to WTO. The first is the compl compliance with obligation of WTO. Uh, it is important to ensure that implementation of obligations and the new government measures are consistent with WTO rules. It may require a new administrative mechanism, increased knowledge of WTO disciplines, and vigilance to avoid problems. Uh, most of you uh, know that in all countries, usually ministries and public agency, they tend to work uh, um, as if they are isolated, as if each uh, ministry working by itself. It is important uh, to, uh, to maintain a constant coordination and cooperation between different organizations and different ministries because the rules of WTO affect many, many organizations. Uh, it's not only Ministry of Trade and Ministry of Agriculture. Uh, in my country, we counted more than 27 ministries and public agencies that are affected by WTO rules. In, uh, in addition, of course, to the private sector. Uh, it is very important to have a, a competent uh, focal point, which is usually the Ministry of Commerce or the agency that are responsible for uh, international trade. And also, it is important to have competent units in each ministry or each public agency that are affected by WTO rules. And these agencies, uh, these units should maintain a constant coordination with the focal point uh, uh, in the capital. In addition to that, you need, uh, even in the private sector, they have to be aware of their obligations and their rights uh, and to maintain uh, close coordination with with the uh, focal point in the in the capital, and uh, the fourth pillar of the structure is to have a competent uh, mission in Geneva, which is the link between the country, the capital, and the WTO uh, as an organization and other uh, uh, international missions. Uh, in Geneva. With this, I uh, pass the microphone to uh, Ibn. Thank you. Well, a very good morning to, to all of you, and uh, thank you very much for coming. I'm grateful to uh, my colleagues uh, to my left, uh, my former boss, 
uh, former Deputy Director General Rufus Echter and my friend, uh, the Ambassador of uh, Saudi Arabia for setting the context. And thank you all for coming, uh, spending about a couple of hours of your time to listen to us. I have counted 103 of you seated here. I've done it twice. The first time I got 101, the second time I got 103. I have a couple of questions for you before I begin, because I'd like to have a sense of where you're coming from. If you were studying law, could you put up your hand? I'd just like to have a sense of the audience that I'm dealing with. Only one lawyer, all right? If you're studying economics, could you put up your hand? Goodness me. More economists. So what, what is the rest studying? What are you studying? Could you? Huh? Political science. Uh, political science. Okay, so basically we are dealing with um, an audience that would like to delve into international cooperation, international relations, uh, the sort of thing that uh, uh, Rufus uh, Exter uh, spoke about. I know that you probably would like to ask more questions than to listen to uh, me for any length of time. But let me tell you, let me identify a few basic pillars around which I would like to construct a few points, just a few points, so that we can have more time for a conversation. What Rufus Exeter did was to take you through the run of international relations end of the First World War, League of Nations, Second World War, the Bretton Woods attempt to construct the main pillars that would govern international relations. They had three objectives. They wanted to build a pillar for an international monetary system that would govern monetary relations and, ex and ensure price stability. They succeeded. That was the IMF. They wanted a development institution, but that would also be a bank. They succeeded. That was the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development. You could also call it the World Bank. And then they also wanted to establish an international trade organization using the same acronym, the ITO. They did not succeed because the US Congress failed to ratify the charter for the ITO. In making this point, it brings us to what we, that what really brought us to Astana this week. It's about trade, it's about the World Trade Organization, it's about its predecessor, the GATT, it's about what Rufus and Ambassador Alokaidi have talked about the enormous benefits and opportunities that come from trade. But what happened in, what happened in Havana and later on the failure to, to ratify the ITO in Congress also tells us something that we are still dealing with, the challenges of trade. Why is it so difficult? 
even though it offers the greatest opportunity. So that brings me to the WTO, an organization that I work for today as an international civil servant. Its root is in 1947, what I just spoke about. And because it could not be an international organization then, what you had basically was an exchange of tariff concessions about 45,000 of tariff concessions. Now that we embed in schedules for goods and schedules for services. So basically, the GATT started up as an exchange of concessions with a few rules. Those rules are some of the most powerful that we have brought into the WTO that Ambassador Taibbi and Rufus have spoken about and which define what we consider as the core values of the WTO and the global economy. What are those core values? Number one, non-discrimination. What you do to one you do to the other. Sounds like common sense, except when you have red lines and things that mean a lot of things to you. And that core value of non-discrimination is broken down into two provisions. One is MFN. It's called Most Favored Nation. It happens at the border of Kazakhstan, arguendo. I'm being hypothetical, and the border of the Russian Federation. I'm speaking hypothetically. What does it mean? Any condition, favor, privilege, immunity, whatever you do to a watch, being imported from Russia, or being exported from Kazakhstan into Russia, you have to attach the same condition privilege and immunity. It's the most powerful principle in trade relations. Every panel, every appellate body conclusion, what we do in dispute settlement is based on non-discrimination. Every other thing is an exception or a delegation. So whatever you take away or you don't take away from this seminar, Say to them that you learned and understood and have imbibed the concept of non-discrimination in MFN. It has a second expression. MFN is at the border. Its second expression is within a country. It's national treatment. It's non-discriminatory treatment to a live product, whether it's of foreign or of domestic origin, but this is within the country, and it's still non-discrimination. It's a core value of the system, it's a foundation. And then we have the things that Ambassador Taibbi and uh, Rufus have spoken about, trade liberalization, opening markets, the market economy, why does it matter? Why does it matter? This core value about market access and trade liberalization, why does it matter? Because most of you are students, but I see a couple of professors. There is a superb statement. It will save me time. I'll just refer to it. There is a superb statement by the current American, Uni the United States trade representative, Michael Froman. He made it on the 17th of June at the Council on Foreign Relations in New York. And the title of it, and someone has a computer there, you can Google it, it's called The Fundamental Strategic logic of trade. Read it. 
for all pages are brilliant. Essentially, she says, we can use it, it's knowledge, the basis of American power is based on free, open markets. We have used it to construct our economies, to build our prosperity, to expand our alliances, and to make friends. And to go back to what Lucas defines, to connect the world through global value chains and trade in intermediate products. So it's a core value, trade liberalization. There's several other values. We have values for trade remedies. When other countries are cheating, and cheating in trade takes several forms, subsidize them in a way that is discriminatory. State trading enterprises, where the state trades and uses its influence in a discriminatory manner. You can use trade remedies, safeguards, anti-dumping, countervailing duties to correct those who trade and dump on your market. It's a core value in the WTO. And then we have development. We have rules. Uh, a lot of this is specialized that you can invoke in the WTO to achieve development objectives, including special and differentiated treatment. Finally, which is what my colleague just said, the rule of law, the rule of law. Sadly, regrettably, we only have one lawyer in this audience. You could question me about my use of adverbs. We have a dispute settlement system that is the most powerful in public international law. Why is the WTO considered as the most, if you like, powerful, if you don't like that word, influential international organization of our time, ever? And you can start from 1815. You can begin from the Congress of Vienna because we have rules that can be enforced. Even the United States, the number one power by far and away, implements rulings against it. They have to, if they want the global architecture to function. And that is what we have that no other organization Why does Kazakhstan want to join? I think you heard it. I just said it all. It's joining for exactly this benefit, to access to markets, access to dispute settlement, non-discrimination. And as Rufus said, I'm quoting him from his comments at the beginning, you live, he wasn't speaking to me, he was speaking to you. You live, we live at a dangerous but at an exciting moment in history. So what's the advantage of Kazakhstan? An organization that secures, where the membership of Kazakhstan will secure your territorial integrity, your autonomy, and your independence. Why? Because Kazakhstan matters. And that was the invitation from our host. Why did we come here? We came here this week to a conference to speak about, to give the government, your government, our views with others. Our views on the role of Kazakhstan. The role of Kazakhstan is vital. Why? Because it's strategic. Meaning what? Because to use the language of Roman of Prodi, president of Italy, former Prime Minister Blair, president of Poland, former, what did they say? I'll use your words, pivot, crossroads, bridge between Asia and Europe, important, stabilizer, consensus builder. That's the role of Kazakhstan, and that's what we think it brings to the WTO. I'll close here.
country is important. We can carry on, uh, but you would have to ask um, uh, questions uh, which probably are more important than the dreams itself. But I hope that we've, um, in some way, uh, given you a direction uh, that Bahutra is important, I say it is important, benefits, challenges, why we came here, uh, and hopefully contribute to uh, your path of knowledge in the post PhD and master's. Thank you. Uh, my colleagues will think that I put you up to it because I've been promoting the LLM in international trade in, in, internally. So thank you for your remarks. <laughs> I didn't know that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, so uh, we'll be putting that back on the agenda saying you said. Anyway, uh, time for questions. Uh, I'm not quite sure. I see this here. Is it maybe this round or? You got it there? Oh, are you back there? Yeah. Okay. Right. So. Hello. My name is Daniela Kolkozova. I'm a senior student at Nazarbayev University, majoring in digital science. I have a question to uh, Dr. Uh, Hidu Sakhir. Sorry <laughs> if I'm pronouncing your name uh, wrong. My question is that um, how will the um, accession, the entry of Kazakhstan to the WTO um, and will it somehow affect its membership in Eurasian, Eurasian Economic Union and its cooperation with um, the members of this organization? Thank you. Hello, uh, a question to all of you. Mm, uh, you said that there are many ad advantages of this mem being a member of the WTO, but what about, what about some drawbacks? I mean, are there any drawbacks? Yeah, well, thank you, you mentioned the, uh, you mentioned the benefits being the WTO. Because there must be drawbacks. Thank you, good question. Yes. Um, for North Memorial Star Center of Software Center, I have actually three questions. One to the uh, former Secretary General of WTO about the WTO reaction to the uh, recent uh, webinar conference going on between Russia and uh, the European countries. And the uh, uh, Russian import ban against European countries. That's the first question. And the other two questions are actually for the Eurasian representative. I want to know um, what happened to the monetary policy of Saudi Arabia after entering into WTO, to what extent the import price has dropped. And uh, what was the implication for his exchange regime in Saudi Arabia? If I could just quickly uh, focus on uh, the drawbacks, um, because uh, it is important for us to talk not just about benefits but drawbacks. There's no question that there are adjustments to be made in any country as a result of trade opening and trade liberalization. In the final analysis, we're really dealing with a belief in uh, the basic principles of economics market economics. The WTO system is based on a belief that uh, market economics really works. But market economics isn't always fair to other individuals. And in fact, you know, the law of comparative advantage, which says that you're better off producing things that you have efficiency in producing and letting other countries produce things that they're more efficient at and it's 
exchange in goods, and that way everybody becomes richer. That's basically the law of comparative advantage. But the law of comparative advantage is not always a politically popular law, and it's also one in which there are winners and losers in the adjustment to trade. And this is an experience we're making. But what happened was we developed other industries that were more competitive internationally. And in any country, your, your competitiveness is changing all the time based on your, um, but it, it does presume a basic belief that you would be able to maximize those advantages in an open economy and you will be able to eventually absorb those adjustments that have to be made because of, because of losses. So, yes, painful decisions to be made about opening, opening markets in certain things, abiding by different rules in areas like uh, uh, technical standards and, and other things. Uh, but the long-term benefits are twofold. One is you benefit domestically by greater efficiencies in your economy. And secondly, you're entering in, as Katie said, the WTO came out of the GATT system. It's an exchange of commitments between countries. It's a contract between governments based on this non-discrimination principle. So while you're opening the market and there are some painful choices to be made there, you're also gaining the right to have the same kind of open access to 160 other markets around the world. And one of the things Kazakhstan has to do in order to, to develop as an economy is diversify its economy. It's now essentially a producer of um, oil and gas products, m mining and minerals products, and some agriculture. And those three sectors, plus of course a services economy, but not much international competitiveness for your services. And those are, those sectors, you have to see that diversify and grow. And you have to look at examples of other countries that had very similar situations. Take the experience of Korea from, from the period after the Korean War to today. And it's a very good example of a country that started as a very, very poor society, mostly agricultural, didn't even have the kinds of resources that you have in, in minerals and metals and, and gas and oil. And today, uh, it's an OECD member. It has a per capita income of $25,000 a year. It has some of the most highly developed and most advanced technologies in the world and big companies like Samsung and others. Why? Because it diversified, because it opened its economy, joined the GATT system, uh, and there were adjustments to be made by Koreans because in agriculture, a lot of people uh, had to change to other, uh, to other work. But in the long run, those benefits were beneficial to the overall development and economic growth. And in fact, it couldn't have happened without there becoming a, a greater participation in world trade. I, I turn it now to, to Katie and the uh, Eurasian Economic Union, talk about monetarist policy, and then maybe Wall can finish up with the issue of recent tensions and what that means. Your question uh, that uh, Rufus has answered, your question is an important one because it's one that we do like to deal with uh, concretely, upfront, and without evading it. There are winners and losers when you liberalize. It's a fact. What my colleague has pointed out is that overall, there are net benefits over and above the deficits. In other words, the winners are more than the losers. Why? Because that answer needs, that answer needs to be concretely demonstrated. Number one, because when you liberalize trade, you improve market access opportunities, you create value. So instead of trading, for example, 
a trade value of one dollar. If you remove restriction, trade value increases. For example, two dollars. Now, these are aggregate gains. These are gains across the board. But in decreasing that value, there's someone who loses a job. Why? For competitiveness and efficiency reasons. Those who make candles may lose jobs to those who produce light bulbs. You know the history of the Luddites. But civilization and economic progress must go on. So what needs to be done? It's adjustment. But it brings us back to the WTO because there's a particular point I want to make. The WTO is not about, stay with me, it's not about free trade. It isn't. It's about improving market access opportunities, opening trade, but in a way that its members can stomach it, can absorb it. Let me give you an example. In the area that bites countries the most. One, textiles. I used to be director of textiles. And there we had a developed country problem with those developed, not developed, those who would lose from the elimination of the MFA. They were given 10 years in the agreement on textiles and trade to make what Rufus referred to as adjustments. Final example, developing countries, agriculture. In all schedules, of goods and services in the WTO, in the WTO. Every member has a huge allowance, huge flexibility to safeguard its subsistence farmers, so safeguard its domestic support by levels of what are called de minimis. There's an allowance. You can support trade because countries understand, members understand, the organization understands what is involved. You just can't do a big bang liberalization. That's not what the WTO is all about. Gradual. Your question was how does how would Kazakhstan reconcile its membership of the Eurasian Economic Union on the one hand with WTO membership on the other hand? Three points. Number one, every WTO member, we have 150, Kazakhstan is not yet a member, it's a member of the customs union. The world is reconfiguring in its trade relations into FTAs, free trade areas, preferential trade areas, and now you have the phenomenon of mega regional negotiations. So that's the point number one to bear in mind. Second point is the Eurasian Economic Union Treaty was signed on the 29th of May this year. It will, when it's ratified, it will come into force in, on the 1st of January 2015. Here's the point. This is the first time in the history of actually the GATT and the WTO that the organization is handling a membership negotiation and simultaneously reconciling it with a customs union that is the Eurasian Economic Union that is still in Eastern region. 
In other words, the entirety of the membership in the Working Party on the Introduction of Cancer Screening is having the opportunity to undertake here, two points, in one bracket, a reconciling exercise. I would just propose that, what I've just said, reconciling with addressing the major issues that arise from customs union and WTO membership, which brings me to my third and final point. What are the specific issues that are addressed <coughs> when an individual member is also a member of a customs union? That's the third point. 3A is tariff adjustment. When you have an original set of parties in a customs union, for example, the Russian Federation, it's a WTO member, and it's also a member of the customs union. It has a schedule for goods and services. And then you have Kazakhstan, a member of the customs union, but not a member of the WTO. And it's already, it had already negotiated its tariff concessions and specific commitments and services. 3A, an adjustment exercise with regard to tariff and services specific commitments have to take place. This is why I have more gray hairs at this point in time than at any other time. That process is ongoing, but there is the opportunity and the possibility for the customs union, that is the EACUCC, and the individual member obligations to talk. And this is what we are playing out, working on the accession of Kazakhstan, which should be done, should be done, probability, by December this year. So, going to, to you, Edward, we want to monitor the process. Just on the question of union, let's remember the biggest customs union in the world, the European Union. Uh, all of the countries in the European Union are members of the WTO. So the WTO rules have recognized for a long time that you can be part of a customs union and still be in. The process Trader was talking about is the reconciliation between the individual's obligations to, to other members and its obligations within the customs union and how you create a proper uh, relationship in, in WTO commitments between those two realities. But being part of a customs union doesn't in any way create a problem with being part of the WTO. That's, I think, the most essential point. Uh, thank you. But before I answer the question <coughs> regarding the trade policy, I'll uh, just add <coughs> to what my colleagues mentioned. I think the question of, uh, for any country, should we join or not is irrelevant because for all countries, the, the benefits outweigh, uh, uh, outweigh the, the, uh, uh, the, the loss of joining uh, WTO. And a major incident that right now there is about, I think, 29 or 30 countries negotiating uh, for to accede to 23, 23 countries in, uh, in the process of joining WTO. I think one third of them are LDCs, which means least developed countries. And this shows that it is very important even for least developed countries to join WTO. To come to your, uh, to your question regarding Saudi Arabia and the monetary policy, there is no direct impact to the monetary policy because the rules of WTO does not directly affect the monetary policies. The monetary policies and the exchange rate usually governed by uh, IMF. Uh, international Monetary Fund. Uh, WTO rules affect financial services, for example, banking services, uh, insurance services, and, and alike. 
but uh, as you know, um, the economy is uh, uh, interrelated and interconnected. So uh, any changes in, 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 in one aspect of the economy might affect uh, indirectly or directly other aspects of the economy. So in, in, in short, there is no direct effect on the monetary policy, but uh, indirectly, of course, the, the situation of the economy generally might have an impact on the monetary policy. Thank you. I think, the, who was it that asked the question about the current tensions uh, and its impact on uh, relationship to, to WTO and the, the fact that there are trade measures there? So I think a couple of things that are important, and I can either of my colleagues add, add thoughts if you want. Clearly, no international institution can prevent uh, certain things from happening in a climate of, of uh, tensions between, particularly between uh, powerful countries or between powerful and less powerful countries with other powerful countries getting involved in it. Um, this is a reality of world we live in, a world still dominated by national sovereignty, even though we have uh, a better framework for global governance and cooperation that we've spoken about in the, in the post-World -war, War II era. It clearly hasn't prevented conflicts, it hasn't prevented wars, although if you compare this period of the last 75 years to almost any other period in recent history, it certainly is one of the um, one of the calmest and best eras. Uh, and that's why the peaceful evolution of, of commerce has been possible. But you're going to have these kinds of situations. It's extremely um, you know, interesting from a perspective of those who look at WTO history to realize, look, Ukraine recently exceeded, Russia recently exceeded, and now you have things happening between them. And in fact, the the Russians completed their negotiations with the Americans and the Europeans just recently, just within the last few years, and now uh, suddenly you see issues about sanctions and about uh, possible uh, retaliation and, of course, trade measures that have been talked about by Russia. Now, what's the relationship of all of that to the WTO? I guess the bottom line is the WTO isn't going to be able to prevent countries from doing that in this kind of a crisis. They are going to have to face consequences with respect to their WTO commitments. If a case were brought and those sanctions were not consistent with WTO rules, you could have a ruling against them in the WTO. But the WTO itself stays out of foreign policy. It is not an institution where those kinds of issues are debated. You won't find a debate going on in the WTO General Council about the kinds of issues you have in the UN when there is a country threatening another country's sovereignty and conflict as a result. Those debates will take place in the UN. They won't take place in the WTO because the WTO is about commercial rights and obligations. And the hope of those who believe in the WTO system is that the peaceful commerce is such a powerful force that it will reduce the desire of countries to take these kinds of, of, of measures in in crises, but it, it will still happen from time to time. And regrettably, uh, that is not going to change uh, just because of your membership in WTO. You still face those potentials in the future. I would say, though, what Katie said earlier, the independence and sovereignty of a nation is much more secure when it is a, a visible part of the international system of uh, rules and commitments characterized by institutions like the WTO. And from Kazakhstan's point of view, this is why it's such a critically important time in your history to be a greater part of that. And in fact, if you look, yes, there are 23 countries still in the accession process, but you know, 97% of world trade is now among countries that are in the WTO system. And so, from Kazakhstan's point of view, you can't afford to stay outside of it. You don't want to be uh, left out of that uh, global community. Okay, thank you. We'll just one more round of questions. Okay, thank you. Go 
up for another. Yeah, well, we just take we just take one or two. Yeah, okay. So we'll just have Mr. Mike Kelly's here at the front. We'll uh, get your opportunity to come. No, you seem to have uh, you seem to have worn them uh, worn them out. The I was just noting as you were saying there that the Irish Times had an image of Russia and Zimbabwe risk exposing each other in DNA Uh, I, just, uh, I would like to take uh, this opportunity uh, uh, to thank you for coming and I would suggest uh, that um, you, uh, 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 on the internet, you see the, 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 the site for, for WTO. There are a lot of information because, of course, what we just mentioned, uh, it might uh, raise also questions that you will think about. So. The, si uh, the site of WTO, there are a lot of information and there are also opportunities for students to get some information or, uh, or uh, internship at WTO. I don't work for the WTO, I'm not uh, part of the secretariat, so uh, my colleague Tilo uh, represent WTO, but um, uh, from my work, uh, as a representative to Saudi Arabia, I uh, uh, came to know that uh, how important uh, to disseminate information regarding uh, uh, World Trade Organization to others. This is just what I wanted to, to bring to your yeah. attention. No, no, thank you for that. And that's, uh, I think we will follow up as an institution, we'll follow up that uh, internship uh, uh, possibility. But, uh, uh, this is a great year for Nazarbayev University will have our first uh, graduating class in the, uh, at the end of this academic year, uh, the 30th of May, I think. Uh, and uh, so at that point, we'll be sending out the world's best graduates in one big rush. Um, so uh, they'll be ready for all the international organizations all at once. And I think now they'll be ready to, to thank our guests. It was really, as I said at the beginning, it's uh, the, one of the advantages of being in the capital city that uh, you know, the people come and we can get the opportunity to introduce our students to them. And I'm very grateful to you for, for coming. And I know on behalf of our students, I'd like to thank you very much. Thank you.